on. So uh, if we could just say who you are, maybe starting with uh, Amy there. Yeah, and it's Anne, it's Anne Marie Gibbons from Town Day Centre. Right, great. And then there's um, uh, John there, John John Doak. Uh, John Doak, Chrysler Day Centre. Uh huh. And James. Uh, James Carroll, Chrysler Day Centre. Okay, and Catherine, Catherine uh, Corriston. Catherine Corriston, Pedigo Day Centre. Yeah, and John Freel. Uh, Chrysler Day Centre. Uh, which day centre, sorry, John? Chrysler. Oh, Chrysler, yep. Uh, Maureen McCafferty. Oh, you're, on, you're on mute, Maureen, yeah. Sorry, Aranmore Island Day Centre. All right, okay. Geraldine? Um, Letter Kenny Day Centre. Okay, and Anne Marie? Anne Agree Day Centre. Anne Agree, so it's good. And then, um, Marion, are you are you with us yet? Yeah. Yes. Just to say the day yes. Yes. Sorry, hi, Marion Quinn, um, Aaron Moore Day Center. Aaron Moore as well. Great, great. Um, me, and of course, I didn't ask uh, the two Margarets because I know you probably all know Margaret, the two Margarets. Um, uh, so you're obviously welcome as well. Um, so what I was thinking of was that maybe to start with, if you didn't mind, because I can take this presentation in, in a number of different directions and I haven't quite decided which direction to take it, is maybe if I ask you to go into, I'll put you in breakout rooms maybe of three or so, three, about three breakout rooms, and maybe just to discuss among yourselves what you feel you'd most want to get out of tonight. You know, what's your burning issue that, 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 you, that you have that you'd like a solution on? tonight so that it's what I'm saying is smack on for what you want you know because uh, there's a number of different is is that all right with you or would you prefer just to go around the table as we are here would you like to go into breakout rooms I've never had a Zoom call before so I'm easy whatever right okay well welcome to Zoom then yeah Anne-Marie it'll be all right <laughs> thank you thank you we could get lost in in, in cyberspace and we never find you again but <laughs> That mightn't be a bad idea either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe I'll do that even just, uh, so just follow the prompts, Anne-Marie, when you see it coming up. And if I just ask you just to say, you know, what would you really most like help with this evening? Any particular stumbling blocks that you have? Just discuss among yourselves maybe for a few minutes and uh, then you'll, 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 you'll come back in the room. And Anne-Marie, if you don't find yourself going into a breakout room, There'll, there'll be prompts there, and we can we can chat otherwise. But don't worry, I think I think it'll all come up. Is that is that okay? Thank you. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. So, I'll just take me a little second. Oh, by the way, before I start, um, the two Margarets, do you want to be in breakout rooms? I'll make a co-host so that you won't fall into a breakout room. Okay. So just a second. Sorry, Martin. Had you any word from Valerie? Yeah, I sent her the link, all right, but um, I had no response. Yeah, yeah, I I texted her there, but I'm getting. She got my message, but she's not answering me. Okay. I okay. Why she's not here? Because do you, would you mind if I rang her? Yeah, you can just put yourself on mute then, and you can give her a give her a quick ring. But Thanks. we're going to, as I said, Jenny, we're going to record Liam's main presentation anyway. Okay. okay so we're we're recording now so uh maybe um if we uh maybe just stop the recording hence so obviously in answer to that question john you know does is the you're being encouraged by the charities regulator to go to full compliance as you said to the next level the answer would be there's certainly going to encourage you to go along there it's not a must but it is a, comp a complier explain policy. In other words, if there's an element of the one of the six principles that you're not complying with, what is the reason? Is there a, a kind of a, a rational cause behind it? That's you won't be struck off anything for 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 not complying, okay. unless obviously it's something illegal. I, I can actually see the sense of going through the whole. You know, they have a, a format. As you go through all these questions sure and, yeah yeah 
and I can see the, the 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 reasoning behind that because it keeps you focused on what you were set up to do in the beginning and what you should keep doing uh, right down along. But it's a very time consuming process for people who are on a volunteer basis, and it's hard to get people together of a similar you know mind or elk to get that process completed. That's the yeah. So what, one of the things that might help this evening is that I, I can go through that CRF form quite quickly because there's an awful lot of stuff in it. But and I can send you after this um, via um, Martin. Um, uh, has Martin disappeared? He hasn't. No, no there he is. I'm, I'm there, you are. there you are. Yeah, you moved around on the screen on me. Um, so <laughs> even you um, So. Uh, is 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 i i have i've put in typical answers or what they're looking for under each of the crf the compliance response form forms if you like uh so that john it's something then that if you were a committee you could maybe assign different people to different sections and they're already given some guidance as to what they might be looking to put into that at least if you've got it done once the job of redoing it becomes more easier Okay, okay, yeah. But it is, I accept it's a time consuming affair. Thank you for that. Any other uh, questions that come out of your rooms in terms of the main challenge that you want help with tonight? And I hope that'll help you, John, and, and your group, you know. Yeah, from a point of view of Fintown Day Centre, um, a way back in the very beginning, I'm talking over 10 years ago, we would have um, had a charity number and all of that, but we haven't. That's it. It's just a charity number. We certainly don't file any returns or anything like that. We're a limited company. Um, you know, there is a lady there who does the day centre wages and does all of that kind of thing. But she has basically she's resigning from our committee now. So we're at a stage where I don't do wages or I'm not set up to do wages or anything. So that's a bit of a challenge that we're facing at the moment, you know, um, because it's getting people you know, that have experience, as John said earlier, you know, that are that's able to do all of this kind of thing, you know, because most of the people, well, there's only really three of us in our party, and most people are, well, I'm working at uh, full time, so it's just, you know, it's identifying somebody that might be able to do that or that's willing to come on board the committee, and I think we're probably very limited in that regard. Okay. So, so again, sure. it's a question of finding volunteers who might just take on the job of completing yeah. the CRF for you. Yeah. Again, and do we need to do that? Do we need mm -hmm. to? You would be advising that we would register as a charity now properly. Oh, and... oh, oh you haven't registered as a charity. Sorry, well, we I knew. have a charity number, but we're certainly not filing any returns or anything like that. Um, so, but that was a, a way back in the very beginning. We got that. So that's is that the, you know, is that but, the HSE charity number? No, it's not. No. 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 Are you employing people as well as financial policy? But is there is there just a list we could say uh, how many policies we need to for governance? You know, for the day centre. Um, I can send a list to again to to martin and he can forward on that list to you as a sort of a checklist of policies not all of which you 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 must have there but it's a good checklist to see which of those are the hse asking you to have in place off the top of my head uh vulnerable adults financial policy um uh, yeah vulnerable safeguarding gdpr um i haven't got the list in front of me but, well, you have health um, and safety well. health and safety uh, uh, conflict of interest evacuation procedure in the event of an evacuation having to take place in your yeah. center which uh, will come under health and safety, health yeah. and safety. Uh, uh hr policies staffing policies yeah. those you know those would come to the top in my head uh conflict of interest and conflicts of loyalty policies well, that's the list, but the next thing I'm asking, if you haven't got these, are there templates available? Uh, in some cases there are, uh, that's a kind of a separate, separate issue, um, but there are, you know, I, I think that's something that could be shared among you, perhaps, because some of you will have some of these policies already. Yeah, no, 
I'll just come in there, Liam, uh, for John. Um, yeah, look, we, we would have some templates that we would, uh, and it would be a, be a framework um, for you to then alter to your own specific center. Yeah. John. Um, so we do, so like the, the various project officers, myself and Lerda and, and, and Margaret, like we, we'll be able to help in whatever particular area that you're in. Um, so also where we don't have a template of a policy, somebody on the network, and this is like with things that we talk about at the network meetings, is that somebody might have that policy and they're able to share it, you know, with yeah. that other center and yeah. adapt it to their specific place. So yeah, um, th there's there's a few um, ways we can get you some. Uh, no, that'd be good. If I, yeah. if I could get the list and, and some templates, then I can do up what I haven't got. You know what I mean? So. Straight off the top, a many here of a vulnerable adults. Uh, Policy. Maybe we'll switch off the recording for this piece. Um, so what I'll do is I'll send a list of policies, and I'll send a template for a vulnerable adults policy to help you on your way in terms of uh, developing policies uh, for your organisation. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, um, I think the best thing to do probably here is to go straight into the uh, compliance response form. Do you think that would be the thing to do? It's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. And you've you, you've heard of the compliance response form, yeah? Does is does this to anyone? Does this mean double dutch when I say compliance response form? No, if we're fair, I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So just this is a bit clunky till I just get to my screen. Um, like this. This will be a new one, Liam. I suppose for Amy there in Fantown. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Who wouldn't be familiar where the reporting would have been an annual thing necessarily? So for anybody that wouldn't have been doing that, this will be a new element. Yeah, it's definitely very new to me now, to be honest. But I'm very interested in in hearing about it. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're being recorded now, but nonetheless, and James said earlier, when was the time to talk? You didn't know what you're, any time is the answer. You know, even if I'm in the middle of this and there's something coming up, I will yeah. stop at the end of each of the six sections for questions and answers. But in the in the middle of it, if something is burning and you're afraid you'll forget it, uh, just, just, just talk into the thing. So can you see the form, first of all? Can you see that yeah. form? Yes. yes, everyone yeah. can see that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, going, I'm going to go through the form and just um, give you an indication. And please feel free to ask as well. So the compliance response form basically has on the left um, the actions our charity should take to meet the standards and then the evidence on, this, on, the, on, on, on the right hand side. So, um, so the first one that it says be clear about the purpose of your charity and be able to explain in simple terms uh, to anyone who asks. So that's another way of saying is, you know, where are the main objects of your charity stated? Are they in your constitution? Do you have them stated? Um, and how do you communicate those main objects? Are they on your website? Are they on your um, Facebook? Um, how do you publicize them? So that, that, that issue is about not just evidence that you have objects, charitable objects, but that you also um, have a, um, that, that you're able to communicate them. The second one there is consider whether any private benefit arises. So what's, what's on there is on the left is, you know, the, the, uh, the actions the charity should take to meet the standards would be things like, you know, if you're going out to tender to repair a roof, do you have procurement procedures in place or tendering procedures or asking for three quotes? Ha have, you, have, you, have you those types of things in places? And that, and, and, and that thereby brings up the first policy. So maybe take a note of some of the policies, as I mentioned, and go through, because that would be in a financial policy, a, d a definite must for, for any organisation. Um, and then the evidence of that would be having a procurement policy, maybe within the or having a financial policy, having a remuneration policy if there are staff, or having pay scales, or having expenses policies. Um, so, you know, does any private benefit arrive? Um, and then thirdly, uh, agree an achievable plan for the year. Uh, what does that actually mean? I mean, at its at its very basis. 
uh, it means having having a plan that sort of states uh, your key goals for the year your key uh, finances and the resources and equipment that you have in place you know that would be at a minimum the type of uh, evidence that you would be, that, that 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 you would be showing there um for a lot of these and this is to sort of encourage you in a way evidence the word evidence on the right hand side can be a, like a discussion uh, at, at a meeting for which there are minutes or it can be a budget for the year or a plan already submitted um that that's evidence of the of of your action there you will find as you go through this that you've a lot of it done already and john you want to come in um the the, the agreed plan you have a committee and you have management within the center so having the agreed plan is a matter of getting those two groups together The, a committee that runs it and, uh, and, and a staff that operationalize everything. Is that what you yes, mean, John? Yes. It's, it's, it's not an easy process sometimes to have both the committee who are running the centre and the management who are, you know, on a day to day basis uh, uh, sing out of the same hymn sheet. OK, very good point, John, because the focus of the compliance response form are, is the trustees or, or the, the committee as distinct from the management. So when the, when the charities regulator is asking, have you a plan? It's really asking, ha have the trustees signed off on a plan? It may be that the management put you know a lot of the work into actually compiling it and doing it, but that might be their duty. But the responsibility lies with the trustees. Mm -hmm. So, th so this document is very much about assuring the charities regulator that the trustees are responsible. It doesn't necessarily mean you're doing it, but it means you're responsible for it. Mm -hmm. Taking ownership of it, yes. Taking ownership, yeah. Familiar with it. And, and so that section there, section three, is about like, you know, is there a need for what you're doing? Have you discussed goals and objectives? Have you a plan? Have you a budget? Um, how do you evaluate success? You know, that, 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 that sort of broad thing of having, having a plan. And then one, one four is make sure your charity has the resources it needs. You see it there to do the activities in the, in the plan. You know, what are resources? Um, resources are three things, money, people, and physical resources. So have you a budget? Have you the people in place to do the work? And have you the equipment or buildings or facilities that, that, that you need? So that's what resources means in the charities regulators terminology, really. Um, one five then from time to time review um, what you were doing and make sure that you, you are still acting in line with your charity's purpose and providing public benefit. Um, so, for instance, evidence of that in, in, on the left hand side, it's really saying are you still on track? Have you, do you avoid mission drift, as they say? Are you still the object that's set out in your constitution? Are you still on song for that? And on the right hand side, it's sort of saying, well, have we minutes to show that we've had a discussion to say, are we still on track with our objects or our goals for the year? Are we still serving a public benefit? Um, have we a strategic planning process, for instance, that, that you know, resets our goals periodically? Th that's all, all, all about re reviewing that you're still for the public benefit. Now, the additional standards in green, which you will be because you would be regarded as a complex organization. Complex organizations can be big organizations, international organizations, organizations with a lot of staff, or organizations dealing with vulnerable people. So you're most likely to fall into the complex category. Sometimes in the complex category, you may be filling it in and thinking, haven't I filled this in above? So I must be answering it wrong. Not necessarily true. Um, there is some little bit of repetition sometimes. So d does develop your charity's oper strategic plan and associated operational plans. So it's very much like the planning question above, except you're, they're talking here about a strategic plan. So the difference with a strategic plan would be that you'd be setting out, have you a plan that's a three or four year document with a big horizon on it? Like, what's your vision? What's your mission? 
what's your strategic high-level goals over a period of years? Um, uh, have your board of management structure? Th those types of, you know, we won't have the time tonight to go into what is a strategic plan, but it's a, it's a bit more than the annual plan. It's like over three years, it's more high level um, than, a, than a plan. And that's, what's, that's what they're getting at there. And again, it's saying, has the board got sign off on this strategic plan? How, how much have you consulted with your users, the parents, the various people, um, or the, the uh, I want to say the parents, the, 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 the families of, of the people who come to use your centre? One seven is, is there an appropriate system in place to monitor progress against, against your plan? Evaluate the effectiveness of your work. That's basically saying, have you a monitoring and evaluation system in place on the left-hand side? In other words, how do you know you're doing a good job? And the way to answer that on the right-hand side is, um, you know, how do you measure performance? What are your key performance indicators? Is it number of people using your centre? Is it satisfaction rate, you know, rates from people who are using your centres? Do you have questionnaires? You know. Uh, do you have case management reviews, for example, periodically to sort of say how various people are, are, are going and what progress or not is, is happening? So it, it's really about, in, in, in layman's terms, it's saying, how do you know you're doing a good job? Who's telling you? How, how do you measure that? And one eight is about, uh, from time to time, consider the advantages and disadvantages of working in partnership with other charities. What is that about? That's about networking. Um, so that on the left hand side, the word there is really networking, um, meeting other charities, liaising with them. And very often what can happen there is on the right hand side, you might have something like a table that sort of says, well, my day centre links very closely with the HSE in the following areas. It links with the local, I'm only guessing, it links with the local Meals and Wheels. It links with the local Active Age Committee. It links with the local whatever, whatever. Um, bridge club, whatever. To act, so, you, you, you know, on the positive side, a little table showing here are the organisations that mean a lot to us, and here's what we how we link in with them. Um, on the negative side, look into the future. The charities regulator could well be saying, look. Um, is this organisation duplicating something else that's happening in the area? Is it necessary? Should they amalgamate? Um, should they, and you see the word there, merge or dissolve? Um, so, you know, in other words, show that the relationships you have are networking positive relationships rather than du duplicitous relationships or duplication relationships. So that's number one. I'm going to come back in the room for a second. So maybe uh, I might turn off. Um, Turn off the recording, maybe at this stage. You, um... So we're we're now into number two, and just a, a good question there in in relation to you know if I haven't got a website, how do I communicate uh, my information? Well, basically, you know, if you haven't got a website, a poster in the in the in the in in the day room or whatever rooms you're using with your key people who use your services, uh, there's no rule that says you must have a have a website. So number two is about behaving with integrity. And in, in a nutshell, really, again, this is about honesty, really. Um, so, you know, I would usually put one and three together, 2.1 and 2.3. Um, so agree the basic values that matter to your charity and, and publicize these. So what is this? Um, it's basically on the left hand side, uh, a code of conduct. You know, has your board a code of conduct? You know, what values have you have you as a board? Do you uh, work to those values? What code of conducts or code of service uh, standards of service have you for the people who use your service? Um, but particularly, it, it, again, the aim is here at trustees. You know, have the trustees a code of conduct? How do, how do you operate your meetings? You know, are, 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 is there a professional code of conduct in the organisation? So. Um, so uh yeah and so number uh 2.2 .2 is how do you deal with conflicts of interest and loyalties so really what is a conflict of interest so it's any place where a charity trustee's personal interests could prevent them 
or even appear to prevent them from making a decision in the best interests of the charity. So there's two things that could prevent that. One is that the charity trustee has a financial interest in the organisation. Um, so clearly, no trustee can have a benefit from the organisation by virtue of being a trustee. Uh, now, for instance, just to complicate that a little bit, suppose the trustee owned the building that the day centre was in. Unusual circumstance, but suppose it was. That would be absolutely fine to be paid for that, provided there was a procurement policy in place, and we mentioned procurement earlier on, and provided the person was chosen in the best interest of the organisation and there was a conflict of interest. Conflicts of interest, a conflict of interest policy. Conflicts of interest, uh, uh, Conflicts of interest aren't bad, they just need to be managed. In other words, that if there is one, the trustee steps outside the door or steps off the committee indeed if it's, if it, if it's severe. Conflicts of loyalty are where a committee member, a trustee, may have a relative who is a user of the service and may be conflicted in terms of, well, you know, I want this for my relative or I want this for the centre. In some cases, those can conflict. So that's a conflict of loyalty. And, and therefore, there's only one winner there and it has to be the, the trust all the time. It has to be the organisation, not the relative. And, and a conflict of interest policy, again, I come back to the policies, that's another policy that's really important to have, is a conflict of interest and loyalties policy. So two, three, particularly if you're a complex organisation, and have a code of conduct of your board signed off by all charity trustees. So going back to 2.1, it's basically saying, have you signed off by all trustees? Has it been discussed at committee level? Have you a register of interests, for instance, in number in, in the right-hand side column of 2.3? Have you a register of interests? So the secretary of the committee straight away has a register of, of, of interests in case they do come up. A relative who is employed by the centre, for example. And so therefore there's a conflict of interest when it comes to discussing remuneration. So I'm going to stop share for a second, uh, maybe to stop the recording as I'll be coming. So you can see 2.1. So we're going to leave 2.1 now um, and go on to 3.3, which is leading people. So uh, leading people, we'll go through the different ones there. Be clear that the roles of everyone working in your charity, uh, both on, on a voluntary and on a paid uh, basis. So again, this first one is very much aimed at trustees. The second one is aimed very much at volunteers. And the third one is very much aimed at staff. So there is a distinction straight away between the three. So the first one really is asking, are you clear on the role of chairperson, secretary, treasurer, and other board members at a board meeting? The charities regulator under guidance for charities has descriptions of what it is to be a chair, what the role of the chair involved and what the role of a secretary is. So again, evidence of your actions on that, looking at this here is a discussion at board meetings on the role of chairperson and secretary and that clarification around, uh, you know, people might have been given a task of going away and looking at the website and coming back and saying any questions on the role of chairperson secretary that's your evidence you know um 3.2 make sure the arrangements in place for effective involvement of volunteers so have you got a volunteer policy if there are volunteers and there are volunteer again coming to your next policy there are volunteer policy templates if you have a policy and the way, best way through them is through the Donegal Volunteer Centre, which in turn is linked to the National Volunteer Centre. And on those websites, you will see a volunteer policy template. So you have a very good volunteer centre in Donegal, and they will have that information and those templates to help you with that number 3.2. 3.3 is uh, arrangements around staffing. So that's really good. You know, on the left hand side is have you got really good practice in relation to staff and employees? In other words, on the right, have you got employment policies and procedures? Uh, have you evidence of an independent system of recruiting? Um, for instance, if you're recruiting, have you a chairperson of the recruiting panel? Have you a scoring system? Do you collect references? Have you a staff 
handbook as well as have you a volunteer handbook uh, those are the sort of evidences in 3.3 so if we go to 3.4 agree operational policies that are in place so again uh, have a check out here for what is an operational policy um, so an operational policy is different to a, another kind of more strategic policy or a, a, a legal policy, which we talked about earlier. It's about a policy that helps you do your job better. So for instance, if you have somebody answering the phone, have you a policy around, you know, if they're not skilled at looking after um, older people or people needing care, you know, have they, have they got basic training on something? I'm just giving an example. Have you, have you things that make your centre just do the work better, operate more effectively. Um, so uh, um, sometimes an auditor or accountant may suggest certain practices that might be better for you to have. That's an example of a better operational policy. Um, locking up when you go home, you know whatever those kinds of policies things that make you uh, more effective so now looking at the additional standard and like that again 3.5 3.6 and 3.7 they're really almost like again repetitive you can see it again aimed at the trustees aimed at the volunteers aimed at the staff uh, 3.5 3.6 3.7 so what really here is is just you, you, what you don't do is say it in 3.5, I answered this in 3.2 above, you know, please go away. Um, you kind of repeat what is in 3.2. You might be going a little bit further in the sense of, you know, in this case in, in 3.5, you might have an organisational chart showing the role of trustees where the, the staff fits in or volunteers fits in or any other groups that you're liaising with, you know, a bit more work on that. Um, where there's delegation of decision making uh, so an organizational chart um, as well as of course job descriptions terms of references for subcommittees that you have that's another example there you have a finance committee has it got TORs terms of reference because again that's clarifying the role of a trustee 3.6 is again a bit repetitive I suppose it is about you know, whereas the earlier reference to policy, you might have discussed it at a, a board meeting, at a committee meeting, good and well, you know, about your trustees that you're looking after them right. Here, there's really a demand for a volunteer policy. The same with 3.7, you know, a really demand here for, for instance, up to date, you know, uh, um, uh, up to date operational policies in place. Um, uh, right across the board and we'll, we'll, we'll refer to policies as we go through. So I'll come back in the room and maybe uh, come in for discussion because we've got that to the halfway point. So if you maybe stop recording while I just come back in the room for questions. Issue about policies. So we had a very good discussion there about what sort of policies are needed and our answer was there to actually in the first instance, it's extremely important that you have an understanding with the HSE as to the policies it requires from you, as well as the charities regulator. And here's a sort of a checklist that you can go through. And if, you know, if it was me, I would be looking very much at behaviour and values, bullying and harassment, child protection, conflicts of interest and loyalty. Yes, a director's handbook. Yes, to maybe a, an internal disciplinary procedure and an external complaints procedure or grievance and complaints procedure. Definitely financial policies. Um, not sure you employ counsellors. No, I don't think so. But if you did, you would definitely have to have that. GDPR, yes. Governance code, yes. Recruitment, induction, and training and development of uh, whoever, be it trustees, staff volunteers yes that would be important um staff handbook um yes risk management yes um and vulnerable adults yes so really that's just uh i'm going to stop share now so if you just maybe stop recording because i'm going to come in back in the main room um and then back that so it's here for everybody 
So the, so the question there was, what might be in a staff handbook? So, you know, here's what might be in a staff handbook. First of all, an introduction element, like, for instance, the purpose of the handbook, uh, where you keep employment records, data protection. In other words, if I'm, if I'm an employee, what are you recording about me in the organisation, or if I'm a volunteer even? Then you'd come to company policies and procedures. What policies and procedures have you in place that, that affect me and affect my welfare? For example, disciplinary procedures, bullying and harassment, health and safety, equality, redundancy. Those are key policies around that sort of area. Then the next thing would be my terms and conditions. What can I generally expect in the organisation around, for instance, probation, hours of work, breaks and rest periods, absence, hygiene, dress code, alcohol and drugs, use of communications and internet and email, confidentiality, right to search, resignation and termination, layoff, exit interviews, phones and use of phones. So there are generally things and obviously paying conditions which would be variable. Um, but, but you know, what standard things across the organisation is expected of me? And then leave and benefits, annual leave, public holidays, parental leave, uh, carer's leave, adoptive leave, jury duty, compassionate leave, um, pension policy, if any. So that, you know, if I was uh, writing an employee handbook, those are the sort of headings a good employee handbook would have. Uh, almost like you'd have some of them inset in the document, and otherwise you would, re you, you would, you would refer. Does that answer you, your question? Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay, so that's what an, a, an employee handbook would be. So what I'm going to do is um, go into um, the share again and uh, so finally, after quite a big detour, uh, we're back. Um, I'm not sure now whether I'm all confused as to whether we're recording or not. Um, yeah, we are recording. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I just don't see the recording prompt up here, but maybe we're top left there. There's no. Okay, that's all right. Um, great. Okay. Um, so the the fourth one is exercising control. Uh, de decide if your charity's legal form or governing document is fit for purpose. Make changes if necessary. Um, so really, the question there is: um, Are your objects still relevant? Is what's said in your constitution still relevant? Um, uh, you know, is your legal form relevant? Are you a charity? Are you not a charity? In the charity's regulator website under guidance for charities there is a draft constitution for unincorporated bodies and unincorporated bodies is a fancy word for a group of people who don't have a legal structure but you can actually create one uh, uh, in, in a draft way and there is one there also for a company limited by guarantee it's worth having a look at that and thinking is our constitution up to speed or could we do with updating it in terms of uh, in, in terms of the new constitutions, the simpler constitutions that are available now. So evidence of that would be discussion of your legal form at a board meeting. Um, and uh, obviously uh, evidence within your strategic planning process or annual planning process of a, a review of, 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 of your legal form. So 4.2 is uh, find the laws and regulatory requirements that are relevant to your charity and comply with these. So, for instance, um, what might these be? And again, have a reference to sort of the policies. If you have a pen, just be thinking of policies again in terms of these are the legal requirements that you need. So the HSE is the first port of call there in terms of legally what must we be complying with? Well, certainly the Charities Regulator Act, that would be certainly one. Health and Safety, Potentially Equality Act, the Data Protection Act, Employment Act, the lobby, no, 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 not that. The Children and Vulnerable People Acts, um, food safety, if that comes into question there, fire and health and safety. Uh, those would be the ones that you'd be. So a check across those sorts of, those sorts of uh, uh, policies and laws 
would, would be the ones to look at. So example of evidence of your action for this would be, um, you know, uh, you know, getting advice and support in terms of making sure you're compliant with these different legal policies. And another thing could be if you have in one place where all your policies are and when they were approved and when they're next up for approval. Because that gives you, anyone reading it, a sense, well, any trustee can lift that and think, here are all our policies, here's when they were approved, here's when they're next up for review, and here's who's reviewing them. That shows control. Because remember, at the top of this is control. And it's really asking, have the trustees control of the policies? Do they know they exist? Where can they find them? Are they up? Do they know if they're up to date? And that 4.2 would answer it in that way. 4.3, um, if your charity raises money. So the question there is, um, if you are raising money, have you any fundraising guidelines? In the Charities Regulator, under the Guidance for Charities, there's a donor's charter. So it's worth having a look at that. And evidence, therefore, of, of that on the right-hand side would be the board discusses fundraising rules, and they can be as simple as that at this stage. Um, because it's asked for again, you might also talk about a fundraising policy or, or donor's policy or something like that to put, to put that in place. So make sure you have appropriate financial controls in place. So basically, what is that really? That is a financial policy. In any financial policy, regardless of whether you're small or big, has usually four elements in it. It asks how you control and record and break down four things. How you control, record and break down income, expenditure, banking, and fourthly, assets and investments. And how do you monitor these? So if you have a financial policy and you're thinking, is it, is it, is it hitting all the buttons? That's what it would need to be hitting in order to sort of answer uh, for 4.4. Uh, 4.5 4 is identify any risks. So really 4.5 is, is saying, have you a, 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 a risks uh, management uh, strategy? Um, uh, and, and what's the evidence? Well, the evidence is obviously having a risk management uh, strategy in place. Um, so 4.6 is make sure your charity has appropriate insurance cover. So again, uh, talking to your insurance broker, are you covered for all the different types of insurances uh, that, 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 that you may need? Ones to think about are public liability, employer's liability, events insurance, professional indemnity, trustee indemnity. Those are the sort of insurances that would come to mind. But has your board discussed the policies? That's again evidence on the evidence side of the equation. So going into the more complex ones, and you said already, God, isn't that, isn't that complex enough, um, is uh, 4.7. Um, so you should have written procedures to make sure that you comply with all relevant legal and regulatory requirements. We've already answered that. You know, it's just the bar is higher here. It, you do need the policies that I mentioned in place. Um, 4.8, uh, is there a formal risk register? So again, we talk about having a conflicts of interest policy. If you have one, it'll automatically have in its appendix a risk, uh, sorry, not a conflicts of interest, a risk register. Um, so if you have a risk management policy, you will have a risk register in place, which really means having high level, medium level and low level risks and what are you doing to sort of reduce these risks. And finally there, um, have you good practice standards in place for what it does. So what does that, um, uh, what does that mean? Um, well, just to give you an example there, um, are there particular requirements from your funder, like say from the HSE, of how you perform what you do? You know, there'll be, I'm sure, enough standards there for you to think about. And then has the auditor suggested anything in 4.9 in terms of, you know, your, 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 your financial uh, reporting, that kind of thing. So I'm going to stop share, so maybe to stop recording while I come back in for questions, in case there are any. So we're now into principle five, uh, working effectively. Um, so again, uh, 
identified charities trustees with the necessary skills to undertake any designated roles and to set out in your governing document. Um, so what's what's needed there? Um, so at a very simple level, what's required just at that point is a discussion at board level um, of, again, what's expected of the chair or the secretary or the treasurer, discuss the roles and the skills that's needed in those roles. Um, and if you want to go a bit further, you can carry out an, a skills audit. You know, what's the, what's, the, what's the skills required on your board and where are the gaps? But at a simple level, just to keep it at this simple level, it could just be, uh, because we come for more complex, we, we'll be coming back to the skills audit. At this level, it's just a, a discussion at a board, at a, at a, at a, at a board meeting. 5.2, um, sort of, uh, so two and three is really about, it's very simple. It's about having agenda, you know, having an agenda for the board meeting. Um, <clears throat> You know, is it is it sent out in advance? On the charities regulator, uh, under guidance for charities and governance code and toolkit, there are draft minutes there, a sample of how to you know have a template for preparing uh, uh, the, the minutes uh, <clears throat> and the agenda and all that. So that that will help you uh, on the sort of agenda. Um, so. And that's even telling you at a minimum what to have on an agenda. You know, have you those items there on the agenda? <clears throat> so um, that's just simply, you know, notice of meetings, having a, having a, uh, having a clear agenda. Um, <clears throat> are minutes recorded in 5.4, are minutes recorded in the sense of decisions? So what's important there is not a recording of discussion, which is usually unhelpful because it can get you into GDP or bother. In other words, if somebody makes a personal comment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a, dis a, a discussion of or a, a, a recording of decisions. What decisions? Why is decisions important? Because trustees make decisions. That's the charter regulator hopes, <laughs> and so therefore a recording of decisions shows you as as trustees are in control. So five point five consider term limits. Again, all that's involved there is a discussion of term limits at a board. Uh, you know, the, the right, charges regulator has not set term limits, so um, so there's no need to have to term limits, everything, but, uh, uh... only to have a discussion. So you might just mute whoever is just coming in on voice there, just accidentally. Um, so 5.5, just a discussion on whether there should be term limits on the board. Uh, 5.6, um, uh, uh, make sure that they receive an induction. At a, at a simple level, in other words, at this early stage, you know, if you're taking on a new trustee, do they meet the chairperson? Are they given a copy of the previous minutes? Um, are they given, you know, a copy of the constitution and any other key policies that are in place? Um, and, and, and really a discussion, that, that, that would be the answer to that. Uh, in 5.6. So then we, we, we move on. Um, so do they understand their role as trustees um, in 5.7? Again, a discussion of the role of chairperson. Um, uh, and, you know, in the governance toolkit, there is CRA guidance on the Charities Regulator guidance on, on an induction checklist. Um, and that induction checklist goes through the things that a trustee should understand. So, you know, <clears throat> the actions in that is that a new trustee will receive documents mentioned in that, in that standard, like the code of conduct, the constitution, minutes and meetings, those, those kinds of things, the vision. If you have a, a strategic plan or an annual report, you know, do, do, they, do they get those? Very simple. It's stuff you already have, stuff you already do. Uh, 5.8, commit in resolving problems and, and emerging issues as quickly as possible. Um, so what does that mean here? It means, um, have you a, a system for resolving grievances between trustees? That's what's mentioned in 5, that's what's meant in 5.8. And, and that goes back to that, you know, 
grievance policy, discipline and grievance policy, or, or even code of conduct, you know, refer to your code of conduct as to, you know, if someone is stepping outside of that, that's where you would bring that in. 5.9, um, has the board considered making any necessary improvements? So an example of, of this might be a, a board review that takes place every year, you know, just an informal discussion at board, at board level. How are we doing? Uh, you know, how, 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 you know, are we good? Is there any place we could improve better as a board? And just have that on your agenda once a year and have a discussion. And then we come to the more complex organisations in the same, and, and again, this sort of similar questions. So it's just a, a little bit higher bar is demanded. Um, so uh, make sure that you send out board packs and enough notice to include any relevant reports and explanatory papers to make informed to make informed uh, decisions. Um, so, um, again, you know, good minutes, good agendas, that's going to get you through there. And as I say, there's actually governance guidance on the charities governance code in the governance code and toolkit on the role of a secretary and how the secretary can record minutes to make sure that decisions are properly uh, recorded. So 5.1, is there a succession plan in place for your chairperson? Um, how diverse is, is your group? Have you, have you discussed diversity and inclusion? And particularly in reference to, your, to, to, your, to your, the groups that use your services. Um, have you, uh, you know, some people have a diversity policy. There are templates out there for that. And then 512, an induction program. Again, this complete guidance on the Charities Regulator web website on what is involved in an induction program for trustees, for volunteers and for staff. So again, just evidence that you understand what's in place and that you make that available for people. And lastly there, um, uh, a, a regular review and assessment of the effectiveness of the board. So really, you know, what does that mean in a nutshell? Um, it means, how does the board, has the board got a number of strategic goals for the year? What are its main goals for the year? And does it review if it achieves those goals or not? That's really what that at its basis is about. And 514, is about has the board the skills to do it and the and the uh, perspective so the, the regular skills audit really covers three things it's asking yourselves as a board have we got this the knowledge about what we're doing knowledge for instance about elder care or knowledge about the tech the technicalities of you know figures and accounts collectively have we got the skills that we think we need as a board or, or the knowledge you know, do we know about them? Have we the skills? Could we actually perform some of the tasks ourselves? And thirdly, are we representative as a board in terms of our, the people that use our services? Are, are we the perspective that ne is needed on our board um, that, that actually allows us to make the, to take decisions with the right perspective in mind? So really, that's number five. I'm going to stop sharing. Last can we can so someone has asked, can we get a copy of the induction checklist? And yes, we can send forward a copy of the induction checklist. So I'm going to share screen again and go straight into number six, which is the final of the standards. And really, number six is all about communication. Um, so, you know, it's the simplest of them all in a way, you know. So again, making sure that you display your registered charity number or cn and all your written materials and again if you don't have a website that's all right um how do you communicate with the people who who not just use your service which is one of the stakeholders but the hsc or other people that are important in you providing a successful service um so um uh, so number three, uh, do you, do you you know do do you do you consult when you have your annual plan with the people who use your services? Do you take any soundings in terms of your decisions? How how do you review the work 
that you've done at the end of a year. Um, so, um, <clears throat> how, how does all that work for you? So, you can answer that in evidence by sort of saying, well, you know, have we discussions at board level about it? Do we consult with our stakeholders? Um, have, we, have we a consultation mechanism in place? 6.4 is make sure you have procedures to deal with queries, uh, comments and complaints. So quite simply, you know, have you a complaints procedures in place? Do you close the loop on complaints? In other words, does your complaints procedure mean that if you have a complaint, not only do you respond to it and explain it, but, but do you dig underneath it and find out why did it happen and can we close that loop so it doesn't happen again? So a complaints policy is, is, is one that comes in there. And uh, six five, five um, do you follow the reporting requirements of your funders? In this case, in this case, the HSE. So you may be saying, look, we report quarterly or we have quarterly meetings with the HSE executive in our area, whatever the answer to that is. Um, so 6.6 .6 is effectively um, the, um, you know, even though depending on sizes, you know, you can have, you know, um, different uh, thresholds of how much you report, the Charities Regulator encourages full financial accounts uh, for it. Um, there are regulations coming in that, um, you know, uh, unless your gross income and expenditure are over 250,000, until then, you know, you, you, um, you, you don't have to supply a full uh, set of accounts um, uh, 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 and they must be, or well, you do have to, and they must be audited. Uh, but the, you know, the Charities Regulator is, in, is encouraging um, full sets of accounts uh, regardless of size. It's encouraging it, but you'll see coming out in maybe a month's time is new regulations around thresholds of expenditure um, and, and the sort of income, guide, the, the, the reporting guidance uh, for each of those thresholds, whether you're under 10,000, under 100,000, greater than 100,000 or greater than 250,000. There'll be different sort of standards depending on that. So check with your accountant about those standards because they are the, the legislation is changing at the moment with the Charities Regulator and these new thresholds are coming in. Um, <clears throat> I won't go into the detail on that tonight. Um, uh, 6.7 um, is uh, a, make sure there are codes of of, of, of practice which they, which are which are publicly uh, stated um, so again you know a values and behavior policy if you're fundraising a fundraising policy if you're dealing with vulnerable people have you got standards by which you are dealing what's your vulnerable policy saying about the standards you adhere to around that have you got care standards are, are they in place where where do they exist and what policies are these contained in? Um, that's really an important one there. But again, if you're with the HSE, you would be doing this. Uh, it's just reporting it. And then actions your charities takes to meet the standards in, ter in terms of improving organisational practice. Um, so again, that's just like, w w what recommendations are you taking on board from the HSE or even your auditor in terms of, you know, the standards by which you can improve your services. Um, <clears throat> and I think that uh, that brings us to an end. You, you might be, want to just stop share, uh, stop recording for a second while we come